Hey everybody, welcome to the SETI Institute in Mountain View, California. We're here for another episode of Facebook Live, or as we like to say, Spacebook Live. We're going to be going to the Antarctic today. And uh, for those of you who follow our SETI Talk series, which we also live stream on Facebook Live, we're going to be talking to a scientist named uh, Tyler McKee, uh, who's a postdoctoral fellow at MIT. And he was one of the speakers on a panel that we had uh, about research in the Antarctic, um, particularly focused on extremophiles or extreme biology. And uh, we're going to be talking about that with him. The reason I'm standing here is we've got a new expedition or exhibition about expeditions uh, that we're developing here at the Institute. So we've got the SETI Institute expedition flag that goes with our researchers in the field. We've got our world map here that we're going to start putting the pins in, showing where our researchers go from the Atacama Desert, the Antarctic, to the Arctic, to Iceland, to Western Australia, and all kinds of points in between. Um, this, in fact, is uh, Dr. Natalie Cabral's diving suit from when she was doing diving in, in this region here. This is actually at the top of a volcano, 6,000 meters or 20,000 feet up in the Andes Mountains in Chile. And uh, you can maybe just barely make out some people here. So this is part of a team that's doing extreme uh, biology research in the Atacama Desert in this high altitude area. So we're kind of putting together a, a display of, um, of equipment and materials uh, and uh, the research gear and kind of showing pictures. There's one of the snow cats that we use up in the Arctic on Devon Island, where we do uh, as well research on things like um, spacesuit design and technology, habitat design and technology, even rovers, and even human behavior. What is it like for scientists to be confined in small spaces like a rover for maybe days at a time to do field research and field expeditions? Uh, we got here Gail Anderson uh, down in the Antarctic um, and is doing his own research at Lake Untersea. So, uh, so interesting display here in construction underway. So we'll we'll give you a closer look at that uh, later on. But um, so this is all germane to the guest we have today, Tyler, uh, who does his research um, also in the Antarctic, and he does diving uh, at lakes nearby the McMurdo Antarctic Research Station, um, and he's trying to understand and look for microbial life in the. Um, Antarctic environment. So he's going to tell us about his research, about his diving expeditions, also what it's like even just in terms of logistics to bring a science team and a research team down to the Antarctic to do this kind of work. And if we're really lucky, he'll tell us how much fun it is to drill a hole in the ice, melt it, that might be three meters thick or more, and then dive down to do some research. So um, without further ado, well, actually, you can see here behind me, we've got a whole bunch of chairs lined up. So. Uh, if you're regular followers of the program, you're familiar with this other project we do called the Frontier Development Lab, or FDL, where we bring together early career PhDs in machine learning and AI, and we team them up with early career PhDs in science domains and tackle all these cool research questions that NASA's interested in and work with partners like Google and Intel and IBM, NVIDIA, Lockheed, and others. So big meeting coming up Tuesday to talk about the research projects we're going to be doing this summer. So that's why we've got all the chairs here. But equally, we've got uh, Tyler sitting here ready to go and uh, take us to the Antarctic. So how are you? Doing well. Good Thank to see you again. Good to see you. Thanks too. for coming. Thank you for having me. Yeah, glad to have you here. And it was great, again, uh, having you do the SETI talk over at SRI. Oh, yes. Yeah, that was really fun. I hope you enjoyed that. It was great. It yeah. was good. So um, talk to us about microbes in the Antarctic. Uh, some people might even be surprised to learn that there are such critters and you know what are they doing there why are yeah. they there what are the conditions um, that they're dealing with and how have they adapted and all, you know all kinds of stuff I mean you yes. could probably talk about this for days but we'll we won't take that much of your time no. and I won't subject you to that either. right 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 <laughs> no it's it's really a continent that is a beautiful microbial landscape mm -hmm. uh, when we think about Antarctica I think it's easy to just imagine the penguins and the, the seals on the coast but once you go inland uh, away from the ocean, it really is a microbial continent. Yeah. And so the, uh, the way that the microbial communities are structured there really depends on what energy they have available. Mm -hmm. In the lakes that I'm working in, most of the uh, ecosystem is anchored around the availability of light. So they are, they're photosynthetic microbial communities. Mm -hmm. um, but if you go 
deeper into the subsurface of uh, some of these ice-covered lakes, uh, specifically ones that are under much thicker ice than the ice-covered lakes I'm uh, diving in. Uh, but glacier-associated water bodies, there you are uh, no longer able to access sunlight, so you have to make your living on chemical reactions. So I think so you still so you still find microbial life life in those environments where it's is it no longer photosynthetic then right and okay. it's a much more uh, marginal ecosystem so that's okay. uh, generally not giving the same beautiful structures that I'm I'm interested in so I focus on areas where you have these uh, more luxurious growth of mm -hmm. microbial communities and on Earth in modern that requires sunlight usually yeah now when you talk about a microbial community you talk about Antarctica. I mean, you look here, and I see a field of snow yes, and ice, yes. and an airplane sitting on it. <laughs> is there microbial life as well in the snow and near the surface, or is it really only in these regions where there's, you know, liquid water or? Yeah. Um, yeah. So there, there definitely is no uh, microbial. There is microbial life on the surface as well, but it tends to be a little bit more restricted. So if you crack open a piece of sandstone that's sitting on the surface, often you'll find just a thin veneer of color underneath there, yeah. which is the pigments of, of these photosynthetic communities. Okay, I've seen um, those pigments yeah, in the Atacama, yeah, actually. Exactly, yeah. and also if you turn over a quartz pebble, right. um, there might be a microbial community growing underneath at that surface as well. Mm -hmm. And so anywhere that there's some shelter, there's liquid water, even if it's not much liquid water mm -hmm. or very regular liquid water, uh, there are microbial communities growing. So clearly you're interested in the microbial communities in and of themselves, characterizing them, mm -hmm. understanding them. But are, is your work also about informing us how we go looking for them and where we should go looking for them if we're going to places like Europa or Mars or Enceladus, yeah, et cetera? Yeah, it, it really is. I think one of the main issues that we have with microbial communities, and this, in particular the, the record of ancient microbial communities, is that it's really hard to tease apart what is just sedimentation without life and what is sedimentation with life mm -hmm. uh, because we don't want to go to mars look in a an ancient lake deposit find something that kind of looks like microbial life mm -hmm. and have a false positive yeah. say that we've identified life but this isn't actually the only way that this feature could form yeah so what we're doing is creating a catalog of these larger scale features that microbes can form and trying to associate with both the environmental conditions under which they form and the activity of the microbial communities to back out what is actually a, a diagnostic signature of microbial life here. Mm -hmm. And also looking at the chemistry of those to understand that. And how diverse is that microbial you know, biology? It, yeah. how, what's the biodiversity like in, in these areas? So it, it can be a very diverse community. It's uh, one of the things that structures diversity here is what sorts of chemistry are available to uh, have different metabolisms cycling energy through the system. Uh, and depending on, on the lake, depending on the ecosystem, that can be uh, more limited yeah. in Antarctica. Some of the lakes uh, have uh, less uh, potential metabolisms than we would say find in the ocean, mm -hmm. um, just because the chemistry is, is different. Um, it's also climates and ocean yeah. water or are they really adapted to this specifically or a particularly cold climate? Yeah, I think in these lakes in particular they're more cold tolerant than they are cold loving. Uh -huh. uh, okay. So if you were to grow them their optimal growth conditions can be quite a bit warmer than where we find them. I see. In fact some of the closest analog communities are found in Lake Huron in mm -hmm. uh, in North America here, yeah. where it certainly is not an ice-covered lake, but uh, these lakes are actually some of the more temperate environments in Antarctica to begin with. Yeah. They are uh, relatively consistent temperatures year-round. Mm -hmm. Some of them have solar heating that raise the lake level, the lake temperature is significantly above freezing. Uh, so sometimes up to room temperature here in the most extreme settings. Is there any subterranean um, heating? I mean, is there something underneath these lakes as well, either in terms of um, warm water that's being fed from you know aquifers deeper down, or or other sources of energy besides the uh, you know the sun? Right. So in these in the lakes that I'm working in, particularly, there aren't. Uh, that was one of the original ideas about why we have 
70 degree Fahrenheit water at the bottom of an ice covered lake in Antarctica, it's easy to assume, oh, there's a hot spring there. Right. Um, but uh, studies uh, in, I think in the 70s, drilled down into the sediments underneath of the lake and found that it got colder again as you went deeper. Okay. Showing that it was actually a local heat source in the depths of the lake, which is where you have the sunlight heating up the water. And if you're deep enough, it's not going to be in contact with the ice cover on top. I see. So you're really isolated. So it's an isolated little layer. Exactly. And it's 70 degrees Fahrenheit it in is. some case. Yes. That's unbelievable. It's like bath water. I know. Way. Unfortunately, it's deeper than where we're diving. So uh -huh. we don't okay. quite so you're get not a tropical enjoying vacation. That. No. Yeah. Yeah. Although so that, like how deep is that? are those kind of warm layers? Uh, let's see. It's probably around 150 to 200 feet depth. Okay. So it's quite deep. In general, how... Uh, how uh, deep are the lakes that you're diving? So the lakes are, I'm doing like conversion between meters, meters and, and feet, feet here, can, so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if, if he says meters, divide by three exactly. roughly, that's yeah. okay. Uh, so <laughs> it's, the lakes themselves can be well over 100 feet deep. Mm -hmm. um, the areas that I'm most interested in though are where enough light penetrates that you have photosynthesis taking place. Yeah. Yeah. So in some of the lakes, that's as shallow as like maybe, 20 to 30 feet is the depth that you have the extent of photosynthesis. And other lakes that goes down well over 100 feet depth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, depending on how clear the ice is, how much sediment is there, can really structure whether or not the ecosystem undergoes photosynthesis. Okay. Now, you know, a lot of people may be even surprised to, um, to hear that there are lakes yeah, yeah, in that's Antarctica, true. right? Because that's you true. can't normally see them. They're covered by snow and ice. I think a lot of folks actually think of Antarctic, like they think of the Arctic, like it's a polar ice cap, right? Uh, and forget the fact, or don't know that actually there's a continent, a landmass underneath. Yeah. Um, maybe, uh, yeah. If you've I'll uh, navigate to a couple of pictures here that yeah. show that off. But uh, uh, so, are there? Uh, how, I, I suppose we probably haven't discovered nearly a fraction of all the lakes that are probably there under the ice and snow, or perhaps we have through radar and other technologies. Um, yeah, we're, we're getting to learn more about, about the aquatic nature of Antarctica. And I think we have a pretty good sense of how water operates in areas that are polar deserts, like this image that I'm showing here. Mm -hmm. This is- Are you uh, able to click over to the image now? Yeah. Yeah, great. This is uh, our camp at uh, the shore of Lake Joyce in the Dry Valleys of Antarctica. And I think it'd be hard pressed to find the lake here, first of exactly. all. Exactly. <laughs> well, so this is this is the the dry valley part of that uh, okay. that term, where it's uh, a polar desert, rocky landscape, and that rocky landscape is actually what allows us to have these these lakes to begin with. Uh -huh. It's an area where water that is being brought in in a solid form by glaciers uh, absorbs heat from from the the local region and melts and that meltwater can feed into these lakes. I see. Okay. So there are these polar desert regions where you have really dry, rocky landscapes, and that's preferentially where you find these lakes. So it's sort of counterintuitive that the driest areas also happen to have these, the lakes. these lake settings. Okay, um, and so, though, so in that case, the lakes are visible at the surface. Um, yes, so let me navigate to past here. This is setting up our our camp on the top of one of these lakes. Okay, so here you're standing on, on snow lake and ice. ice that is on top of the lake. Exactly. Okay. So this here is about three meters of ice uh, with our, our camp being put up on top of it. Um, and in this setting, uh, there's probably about 150 feet of water underneath of us under that lake ice. Wow. And how thick is that ice? Uh, here it's about 10 feet thick. Okay. Yeah. And about what latitude are you at, by the way? Yeah, so here, let me see if I can get this right. I think we're around 72 degrees south. Okay. So it's, it's quite a ways down there. Pretty far, yeah. 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 Yep, amazing. All yeah. right. Uh, and and so this is, um, you're, you're setting up the one of the uh, campsites here. Exactly. We're actually so. setting up our dive tent. Uh, okay. This site here. Yep. So we uh, we tend to. It's nice to have shelter to get out of the wind when you're doing diving work. Yep. And so uh, it it uh, is generally a structure that we use to keep our diving gear warm, keep things from freezing up, and uh, the last thing that we want is a, a frozen regulator that makes it hard to breathe. The diving operations. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You said something interesting uh, the other night. Maybe you can talk a little mm -hmm. bit about this. Um, uh, that you know, of course. Um, 
we think about it and we think, okay, the person in the diving suit is the crazy one yes. <laughs> who's actually going to go diving in this water. You pointed out actually that, um, you know, if you're an experienced diver anyway, you're actually in some cases better off than the people on the surface <laughs> who are maybe standing in a blowing wind and snow. And that is certainly else, true. So that's fine. Uh, it's, it's a rather inhospitable environment, especially in the afternoons when it clouds up and the wind picks up. Um, you don't really want to be just sitting on ice. Yeah. Uh, it's nice when you're moving around, when you're walking, when you're underwater. The water is cold, but if you're dressed appropriately, mm -hmm. uh, wearing the right gear, um, you can be effectively out of that wind. Yeah. The water does remove a lot more heat more quickly than, than air does, but uh, sometimes if you're swimming around and staying active, you actually do stay quite warm. Mm -hmm. What are the uh, kind of outstanding science questions you're pursuing? in you know going back on a regular basis to these sites and and you know collecting samples and, and looking to uh, at at the microbial uh biosphere there what, yeah. what are you trying to uh, get at yeah so the main research questions that are are driving this work center around how we can interpret records of these microbial communities that can enter into sediments so i uh, microbial communities don't fossilize very well. Mm. Um, and if they do fossilize, their shapes don't really tell you much about the way that they were living. So, so for example, if we were looking at sedimentary layers on Mars, exactly. and there had been past microbial life, we wouldn't necessarily find fossilized evidence of that. Right, uh -huh. so okay. it requires very specific conditions to get actual fossil preservation of microbial communities. Mm -hmm. uh, so instead of looking at those fine scale features, we're looking at how they form in aggregate. Mm -hmm. So what are the larger scale features that they, they create as a community? I like to think about it sort of like the shape of a coral reef. It's not something that's intentional, but it's all these different communities operating on their own that together give you this larger emerging phenomena of a microbial structure. Yeah. And so coming up with a way of interpreting the way that these are growing, the shapes that they're forming, the, the patterns of growth, and then also the chemistry that can be preserved in minerals that are forming alongside these uh, can give us the tools to really interrogate these records either earlier in Earth history or in other planetary bodies. Uh -huh. Okay, excellent. So do you have some, some you know, want to walk us through a little bit of, give sure. people a sense of, of what it's like to do an expedition down yeah, in the Yeah, I will. Uh, how are we doing on, on questions? We don't have too many questions. If you, if you do have questions for Tyler, if you'd like to uh, ask something uh, about his work, about the Antarctic, about you know, the uh, technology and, and other issues behind diving in this environment, uh, let us know. We're taking down your questions. We'll get a chance to, to ask them. Um, in the meantime, you know, some thumbs up for, for uh, Arctic and Antarctic research and uh, for the fact that we've got microbial habitats in places like this which of course bodes well for those of us trying to look for life uh, in the universe more broadly. I mean, yeah. We find it's pretty pervasive in places we previously thought there wasn't any. It's right? true. It's just an ice-covered lake. Yeah. There are no animals around. Clearly, why would we expect there to be life there? Yeah. And so it wasn't until uh, people went down and looked at these microbial, these lake bottoms that we understood there was something worth studying there and worth putting in this, uh, this much of a, uh, an effort to set up a camp on site, to do our diving work. Um, it really is motivated by this exploration and, and discovery. And the bottoms of these lakes are very understudied right now. So You know, it's really interesting because I'm looking at that. So I think it'd be helpful as well if you can give people a sense of scale. Yes. How big are these filament-like yeah. structures that we're seeing here? So uh, when we're looking at these individual pinnacles, I'll just uh, play this again. Uh, we're looking at, at structures that are on the order of a few inches tall. So we're maybe looking at pinnacles that are this tall. Okay. Um, so it's like blades of grass, but spread out a little more. And exactly. It and each it's one of these, microbial life. right? Each one of these is a, an aggregation of a huge number of, of bacteria, all doing their own thing, growing in their own way. But the way that they move, the way that they respond to different gradients, allows these more complicated patterns to emerge. Yeah, it's quite quite beautiful, actually. It is. It's funny, you know. I look at that, and I can absolutely imagine being on Europa, mm. drilling a hole, 
dropping a camera down and lo and behold, you know, finding the bottom covered with, with uh, you know, bacterial mats that look just like that. Yeah, just, so. It wouldn't shock me at all having seen this. Right, so this might be your view going down there you go. the hole. <laughs> so uh, tell us about that. Yeah. That's a great shot. <laughs> so this is, uh, when we're doing this work in Antarctica, it's a lot of energy to make a dive hole and a lot yes. of time invested into that. So we, we melt a hole for diving by pumping a heated antifreeze through a metal coil on a closed circuit and setting it through. It takes about a day or two to melt that hole. Oh, wow. It's okay. a lot faster to drill a hole and yeah. drop a camera down. So talking about Europa dropping a camera down. Yeah. So often what we'll do is we'll survey the lake and uh, drop cameras in different areas, drop different instrumentation down to measure what the local environment is like, mm -hmm. and then choose a dive site that allows us to ask our research questions in the most efficient way. So it's it's actually very similar to uh, some of the mission architecture for exploring Mars, say, where you have uh, orbiters that come and give you this contextual information, and then you choose a landing site that gives you all of the types of data that you really want to capture. Yeah. Here we're doing it with holes drilled through the ice. So this is a uh, uh, the downward looking view of the camera as we're lowering it, the two lasers are uh, 10 centimeters apart for a scale. I so that okay. when we're looking at the bottom of the lake, we know are these pinnacles... How big they are. Exactly. A foot okay. tall? Yeah. Are they yeah. a couple inches? Oh, that's um, clever. And it gives us a way of, of previewing this environment. So, but this is a drilled bore with borehole. It is. So, but if those are 10 centimeters apart, that, so the hole must be actually pretty good size. It is. Um, I have a video here I will pull up of drilling one of these holes. Oh, great. Um, let me make this a little bit larger. Um, but it's it's not trivial to drill a hole. It's a lot less work than, than diving and making a dive hole, but it is a fair bit of work. This is uh, very much sped up. Um, but we use a jiffy drill. It's the same type of drill that you'd have when uh, drilling an ice fishing hole. Uh -huh. um, and once we get through the ice, we uh, unclip the, the drill head, and then we remove our flight. Oh, look at the size of drill. Whoa! <laughs> so it's, uh, it's a lot of ice to drill through. My goodness. Um, and we drill it uh, meter by meter. Yeah. Every meter we go down, we stop, we put on another flight, Add another, oh my drill God. down another meter. Right. right. And so it's, it's a, an intensive process, but um, gives us some beautiful windows into what's actually happening at the bottom of the lake. Right. Now, are there any reasons and the kind of research you're doing that you're also doing core samples of the ice and looking at what's happening at different depths or layers? Yeah, so we haven't done as much of that intensively. I know other uh, folks like Dale Anderson has done work uh, with stratigraphy of these these lakes. Right. Um, but one of the things you can do as you're descending through the dive hole mm -hmm. is look out alongside and see horizons in the ice that represent different years of growth. Yeah where you have uh, accumulation of ice on the bottom of the ice cover in the lake water, and you lose that mass off the top by ablation. Mm -hmm. And so it's basically a conveyor belt where the oldest ice is at the top, the youngest ice is at the bottom, mm -hmm. and anything like microbial mat that gets caught up in the ice works its way at, on that conveyor belt over a decade or so mm -hmm. to the surface where it can then be blown by the wind and transported around ah, the, the so valleys. So another example of, of biology transport mechanisms exactly. that I wouldn't exactly. have even thought of. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so everything in these lakes, uh, generally there's been a filter on who can colonize environments in Antarctica. Mm -hmm. It's who can be freeze-dried and blown around to recolonize And recolonize wet someplace spots. else, yeah. yeah. Fascinating. Um, maybe you can go back to your first picture because yes. everybody loves to see a big plane uh -huh. with expedition gear getting loaded yes. or unloaded or whatever. So maybe, maybe you can walk us through, through uh, some of your, your slides here. So I... Uh, do that indeed. While you're pulling that up, um, I'll say hi to some of the folks who've told us where you're tuning in from, which we love to do because it's always amazing uh, how far and wide we're going here with these uh, Facebook Live events. So we've got uh, Lake County in Northern California, great to have our neighbors on, Edinburgh in Scotland, Indianapolis, Indiana, Manoa, New York, uh, Antofagasta, Chile. I've been to Antofagasta, Chile on my way to the Atacama with our NII team, that's, a, that's an amazing place, uh, right on the coast, spectacular, and, an, an, and right near the Atacama Desert, absolutely fantastic. Uh, Christiansand and uh, Norway, I've been there too, down near the southern tip, if I'm not mistaken. Florida, we've got folks on uh, from Charleston, South Carolina, from München in Germany, and Huntsville, Alabama, Boulder, Colorado, Melbourne, Australia, 
we've got the Australian Opens coming to a close there. Uh, Delta, Ohio, Budapest in Hungary, uh, Mobile, Alabama, Crowley, Texas, uh, Sao Paulo in Brazil, Thunder Bay, Canada, Dallas, Texas, London in the UK, Cottonsville in Maryland, and uh, Walnut, California. There's a Walnut, not just a Walnut Creek. I know Walnut Creek, I don't know <laughs> Walnut. They forgot the creek, they don't have a creek. And then Hope, British Columbia in Canada. So just a few of the places that you're joining us from. So thank you for joining us from far and wide, and especially those of you in Europe and elsewhere staying up late to, uh, to be Tyler. Very cool. Yes. So um, I have a less charismatic photo to start here. All right, let's talk about is, the less charismatic stuff. That's this is still the indicative real world. of our uh, experience going to Antarctica. This yeah. is my view from the seat uh, on the flight down to Antarctica. Is that right? So yes, you're not we in are cargo. Class. We are cargo. <laughs> is that true? And there are pallets of field gear that are all stashed on the front panel in front of us. And you're hoping they don't come loose. <laughs> Fortunately, they're pretty well tied down. We yeah. have the the. Uh, National Guard there, uh, making sure that all works. So what kind of aircraft are you coming in on? Is this so a C-130 or it something? It is a C, so we're, we typically fly down on a C-17 and oh. then fly back on a C-130. Okay. Um, so it, there is a little window on the side of the airplane that you can peer through and uh -huh. get a bit of a, a more scenic view. That's a great so shot. That's this is one of my first views of Antarctica on the way down. Uh, we fly straight south from New Zealand and uh, end up uh, going over much of uh, well, it's all northern Antarctica, <laughs> but much of I think it's Queen Maudland going down from uh, from New Zealand. From New Zealand. There. So, how long is the flight? Uh, on this plane, it is around six hours. On a slow plane, the C one thirties are a little bit slower, being propellers and having skis. Yeah. Uh, that takes closer to nine hours. Wow. wow. So uh, it's a bit of a flight. And this looks like glacial activity here. It does. Um, yeah. So we have uh, ice streams coming off these large glaciers that are exiting Antarctica and entering into uh, the Ross Sea here. Yep. Um, and as we head further south, we uh, approach uh, McMurdo Station, which mm -hmm. is on an island, inland. Uh, oh, I didn't know McMurdo was on an island. It is, yeah. Ah, interesting. Uh, let me see. And, well, this is the cockpit. But oh, we, show the cockpit again. Okay, That's great. Fine. Gotcha. Yeah, so uh, the one. cockpit of the, the C-17, unless, unlike a domestic flight, they actually let you go up and right, see what yeah. they're doing. So. <laughs> they can't do that anymore. <laughs> No, yeah, that's um, nice. but uh, we land on the sea ice that is actually outside of this island. It's Ross Island, um, where Mount Erebus is. Do they do anything to kind of flatten it or treat it, or it's is it a just groomed ice runway? It is a groomed ice yeah, runway. Yeah, it is. Wow, fantastic! Um, and so uh, on this runway, you can land on on wheeled aircraft. On yeah. other runways, there you have to use skis. Yeah. So it depends on the preparation of the surface. Right. Um, now, how big's the team that you're part of here? So, uh, typically we've been between three and seven people in the field at a time. So we're pretty small tent camps yeah, yeah. Um, setting up there, and we're uh, spending all of our time out in the valleys. So yeah. while we are uh, going through McMurdo Station to set up our camp, we then helicopter out to the dry valleys and are there for the duration of the field season. Okay. And then how far is the landing strip from McMurdo Station? Uh, so. It depends on which one you get to go to. Mm -hmm. um, when they have the near runway, it's a fairly short ride, but um, when they put up the big sea ice runway later in the season, it can be about an hour ride across the ice. So they're not coming in Uber Prius cars. What, what are no. you uh, heading back to McMurdo in? Uh, I have a picture oh, here, actually. Yes. Uh, so uh, they have very large people movers that they take you in, wow. one of which is Ivan the Terrabus. I so, like that. <laughs> puns exist. Ivan the Terror Bus. Yes, puns okay. exist even in Antarctica, maybe especially there, but you can see people standing next to the wheel there for scale. Uh -huh. um, and it's it's a bit of a an epic entry into the, the continent when you land on ice and are welcomed by these, these large vehicles. Ivan the Terror Bus. And so um, the others with you on that aircraft then are presumably part of other expeditions, yes. other, other research yes. programs going on. Exactly. So it's a it's a flight that also shares with other national Antarctic programs in the area. The New Zealand Antarctic program shares with the U.S. and their logistics. Um, I think there's a, a French base down there as well. So it, it actually attracts a lot of different nationalities that can share in that experience. Yeah. Um, I think I even have, yes, 
the New Zealand program gets picked up by a slightly uh, smaller oh, vehicle. Th these um, are the limos, I guess. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I spent uh, two seasons with the New Zealand program and three with the U.S. program, so right, right. got to see how things are done on, on both sides of that experience. Uh, so the New Zealand folks are treated with, in business class. And exactly. We're, we're on buses. That's well, so there are much fewer of them. Their base uh, maxes out, I think, around 300 people, whereas okay. the U.S. base is over 1,000 during the peak summer. Yeah. So That's it uh, is a, lot a of folks. different scale of operation. Sure, sure. Um, so that's a nice picture. That's McMurdo Station. Okay. Um, so that is looking down from uh, Ob Hill, it's called, which is uh, one of the hikes you can go on outside of the, the station. It's also where uh, Scott's crew went to watch for him coming back from uh, his ill-fated expedition to the South Pole. Oh, right. So it has a, a memorial yes, on top for that uh, expedition. Interesting. And uh, in the far ground, there's this little spit that sticks out and uh, Scott's hut is there from uh, one of... Can you move your mouse to that? I can. Let me... Where, uh, there is a hut just right down here from one of the early expeditions so you can tour and wow. see the artifacts that are there from, from the early explorers. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Hut. Huh. All so, right. That's a, that's a fabulous shot. Um, the weather isn't always that nice. Sometimes uh, <laughs> hiking like is this. a little bit more of a, of a slog. But uh, it's still well worth it to get out and see some of the Antarctic landscape. Now, the daytime temperatures in McMurdo in the summertime are? In the summer, peak summer, it can get well above freezing. Okay. Um, and that's actually one of the least pleasant times to be there because the roads all turn to mud. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. So it's mud season. Yeah. Um, I, I think the spring is, late spring into summer is when it's, it's generally, that's when we are going through the base. Mm -hmm. And it's usually between freezing and maybe 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Um, so it's, it's not as cold as it is in, in the winter or early season. Yeah, yeah, a little more pleasant. Exactly. Uh -huh. And so is that your typical uh, time slot is you, you aim for springtime? Yeah, mm -hmm. we're working on the lake ice in the dry valleys. If it gets too warm, they get really slushy. Yes. Yeah. So um, it becomes a lot harder to work there and you can have pools that are in maybe a few feet deep that you could easily fall into on the right. lake ice, which while you wouldn't fall into the lake proper because you still have 10 feet of ice underneath of that, it will get pretty soggy. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's not, doesn't sound like fun. Not ideal. <laughs> Great, Yeah. all right. Uh, let's see. Oh, there's audio on that one. <laughs> so this is uh, less pleasant conditions in Antarctica. Uh, sometimes they uh, shut down uh, traffic by foot in the base as well, where you have uh, conditions such that the visual is limited between them and you can't actually get out to walk from, uh, from building to building. Mm -hmm. So it's... Uh, the conditions can even be limiting on base, more so than when you're in the field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let me see what else I have coming on here. So in, in comparison, this is the New Zealand base, which is a much uh, smaller setting, but uh, yeah. definitely a nice a nice setup. Looks well. like they went for the green decor. Exactly. And sort of stuck it just with reminds that. you of vegetation a little bit <laughs> when there's nothing else green on the continent. Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, but, and I guess that's true. So even in the summer, uh -huh. and even when the temperatures are rising a little bit above freezing, maybe for days of time, you're still not really getting any green vegetation on the surface. Right, or, right. Yeah. not in this part of Antarctica. Okay. If you go up onto the peninsula towards South America, there you do have more vegetation. I see. Um, but it is still quite limited. Yeah. There are a few areas near here where there is moss mm -hmm. that uh, grows, but that's sort of like the Antarctic rainforest equivalent. Yeah. Just a few crusts of moss. Yeah. Yeah. Still a very exciting ecosystem. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there's a, there's a little critter that is becoming increasingly famous uh -huh. for little critters. Um, and that's uh, tardigrades. Yes. <laughs> little yes. water bears. And if you've never seen one, you know, they, I, I think the typical one is something like a third to a half a millimeter. So tiny, tiny little thing. But you look at them under a microscope and they look like little bears. They've got a little snout and they've got eight feet and... So forth. Do you see those? Uh, they are present throughout. Yes, really? they're in the lakes, they're in the streams, they're in the ponds. They are, yeah, they are present everywhere. Yeah, um, yeah. they are hardy little little critters. They are. I mean, they they survive outside the space station for yes. days or weeks at a time. They 
seem to be able to like hibernate even for decades or even longer, maybe so, even thousands of years. Speaking of things that could be very amenable to freeze drying and wind transport mechanisms in the dry valleys, tardigrades could easily hitch a ride on some, some debris from one liquid water area to another liquid water area. Yeah, yeah. So it makes sense that they would be found throughout. Have you by any chance read the book, uh, The Three Body Problem? I have not. Okay, well you've got to read that book, okay. but one of the funny things or interesting things and interesting ideas about that is because of the dynamics of this mm -hmm. planetary system and its stars, uh, life has to go into long periods like thousands or millions uh -huh. of years of sort of hibernation. And you know, reading the book, I thought, well, gee, then, you know, this doesn't sound like very viable. Um, and then you find out, well, actually, tardigrades can do it, right, <laughs> right, and have done it. So it's not as wacky an idea when you uh, when you get to familiar with the little water bears as you as you might originally think, right. uh, Reading or even Earth history, because we have these Snowball Earth episodes where it does right. look like surficial life on Earth may have had a pretty long hiatus. So talk about that for a minute, because yes. that was something we explored with you at the SETI talk. Yes. Uh, this whole thing about snowball earth. People, that may be a new concept yeah. for some of our listeners. It's, Tell us what that is. I think that saying Antarctica is a really good lead into that. Yeah. Uh, it's a time period in earth history that we uh, have evidence for essentially similar depositional environments we now see in Antarctica. Areas with a lot of glacial influence, uh, glaciers bringing icebergs into the ocean. Um, we have this sort of depositional environment but all the way down to the equator. Mm -hmm. So one of the uh, big uh, questions is what can make Earth's climate so cold that we have sea ice at the equator? And one of the, the mechanisms that has been called on for this is a positive feedback where once ice starts to advance beyond a certain point, it's reflecting much more heat than, uh, than the ocean does normally. Yeah. And that can give a, a positive feedback where you then encapsulate the world in ice. A so there have been these periods where, where the Earth looked like Europa or Enceladus or something like that. For tens of millions of years. That's unbelievable. And one of the questions though is how, how hard was this, was this snowball? Was it slushy? Did you have areas with liquid water still? Mm -hmm. Or did you have such a strong positive feedback that you froze the entire oceans to a depth of maybe half a mile or more. Mm -hmm. And so those are sort of the end members in this, but it does look like we had these very cold periods and uh, significant changes in Earth's climate associated with those, that life did make it through. Somehow. Exactly, yeah. and it may even have stimulated uh, expansion of more complex life. So these are not what we typically think about and learn about in school as kids of the ice age. Right, right. Where, you know, you had the glaciers moving further south. These are periods of total Right. You wouldn't call it glaciation. I guess you'd just call it freeze over yeah. of the entire planet. Sometimes they're called pan glaciation. Pan glaciation. Yes. And how long ago was the most recent pan glaciation? So there is evidence that we had uh, the last of the major ones around 635 million years ago mm -hmm. it ended. Um, but there may be another one that happened a little bit later um, in still before the Cambrian, where mm -hmm. you have this explosion of shelly life. Yeah. Um, so the the last really long duration one seems to have ended around 635 million years ago. 635 million years ago. Yeah. So a few hundred million years before the dinosaurs. Right. And the Ten times as long ago. Of the Earth, uh, you know, we looked like a snowball. Right. Now we have the opposite problem. <laughs> it's it true. And and but similarly, you've got feedback mechanisms at work in the opposite direction. Exactly. Right? Um, and that's how it's uh, interpreted that we get out of these snowball episodes. Uh, the same positive feedback can run in reverse. Uh, when you have the, the world glaciated, there's still volcanoes that are releasing CO2, uh, but you have really shut down your sinks of CO2. You're not uh, eroding and weathering the continents. You may have less uh, biology sucking up CO2. And so your atmosphere can build up a huge amount of CO2 to the point that that greenhouse effect mm -hmm. can overcome the uh, loss of, of, heat of heat from the ice. Right. And so once you start melting, the oceans absorb, absorb more heat, the ice recedes, the ice reflects less heat, the oceans absorb more, and you have a positive feedback in the other direction. And that's what we have uh, certainly on the North Pole. Mm. Uh, and we are seeing it on the South Pole with, with you know, uh, massive uh, breakaways of, of ice sheets and, right. and you know, receding glaciers and, and so on. Have you seen evidence of climate change and global warming 
on the research you're doing with respect to the biology? There certainly has been. The lakes that I'm working in in Antarctica are really sensitive to changing climate. Uh, some of the people I'm working with, that is their driving question, is how these systems are changing in response to climate. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so one of the main ways is with increasing, uh, with the changing climate of that region, there's more meltwater that's produced. Yeah. Uh, so the glaciers are melting more, there's also more snow in the area, so you have all sorts of changes in how the system operates. But in total that leads to lake levels rising. Yeah. And so in uh, one of the lakes that I've, that I've been working in most, the rise has been about, let's see, on average a uh, foot per year. Wow. Um, and so if you're uh, a cyanobacteria under 15 feet of ice, trying to make your living on every photon that comes through that ice, having your lake level rise dramatically can effectively drown you out of the depth where you could make a living from sunlight. Yeah. So if you go to greater depths in the lake, you have relic ecosystems that are no longer able to do photosynthesis and are just slowly decaying. Mm -hmm. um, that has exposed new areas in the shallow parts of the lake to colonization by new microbial communities. So you're essentially shifting this bathtub ring of photosynthesis from deeper parts of the lake to shallower parts of the lake. Yeah, yeah, incredible. Um, so as far as you're concerned, yes. climate change and global warming is not fake news. <laughs> no, no. You're seeing real evidence yeah, of it. Yeah, having worked in both the Antarctic and the Arctic. And I don't think you have a political agenda behind this. No, I don't. <laughs> I mean, it does, it does give me a really interesting system to study because sure. you can use it as a uh, kind of natural experiment to see how this is how responds yeah. to a perturbation. Yeah. But that's by no means outweighing any of the consequences. Yeah, absolutely. We did have a question here, which uh -huh. is, what common life is consistent under the ice lake? In other words, is there a particular um, uh, microbial um, mm. biology that is the most common? Or, yeah. yeah. So if we look across these different lakes, uh, there are commonalities. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the lakes and the shallow depths are typically dominated by uh, cyanobacteria that grow in filaments. Mm -hmm. They uh, are long and skinny in their, their general shape. And uh, there's a suite of these types of cyanobacteria that tend to be abundant in, in the lakes. Yeah. Uh, there are also um, different types of diatoms, little uh, algae that grow on the bottom of the lake. But by and large, the bulk of the, the biomass that's being uh, added is on the bottom of the lake. It's not in the water column. Okay, it's and that's, on the bottom. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so that's... A, an interesting feature of these lakes that they have in common with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very low nutrients generally, yeah. and these mats allow for really efficient recycling of nutrients where the decay at depth uh, gets recycled into growth at the surface. Mm -hmm. And so um, organisms that can make the most of this sort of environment tend to be found in all of those lakes. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned uh, coral uh, yeah, reefs yeah. and things like that. Now coral reefs of course develop their own Kind of ecosystem mm -hmm. and their own you know local biology yeah, and biological yeah. environment um do these like those mats that we see do, do they create a larger ecosystem of biology that exists because of these mats they and, certainly you know, do to get a complex community going on yeah they certainly do uh they create uh environments that are chemically distinct mm -hmm. so in some places uh you will have uh, anoxic water above and anoxic sediments below, but a little skin of oxygen where you have photosynthesis taking place in these microbial mats. Yeah. So if you were an aerobic organism like we are, um, or like any other microscopic uh, heterotroph that's going to be uh, chewing through uh, organic matter, mm -hmm. you're creating a little oasis that is a, a habitat that can be exploited there. Okay. Um, they're also creating all sorts of organic molecules that other organisms can consume. Um, so it, it, it really is a, a dynamic ecosystem just on a very small scale. Yeah. There are nematodes, which are microscopic worms, yeah. and those in the tardigrades are really like the lions in this, in this <laughs> the, savanna the that we have here. <laughs> um, so it's, you just need to scale your expectation for what uh, an ecosystem functions like. Yeah. So if you haven't done this yet, go ahead and Google tardigrades and click <laughs> on images and take a look at them. 
uh, and you'll realize that you don't want to see, you know, like a human-sized version of that snuggled up to you in, in bed at night because they're they're kind of they're kind of funky looking. At some level, they're kind of cute as well. So you just don't look too close. Yeah, don't look too close. <laughs> <laughs> they could be the mouth parts cute. are terrifying. Um, okay, let's see. We've got another question coming in here before we wrap up, and um, I think this is from uh, Evan. It says, do you take any precautions not to cross-contaminate uh, from one lake to another, or is that even a concern? That's a great question. That is a big concern. Yeah. Um, and I think that it's actually a, another learning experience we can have that applies to the search for life elsewhere. Is, mm -hmm. uh, planetary protection principles apply in Antarctica as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we really try not to transport um, biological material from one lake to another lake or yeah. one valley to another valley. Uh, we sterilize all of our diving gear, all of the equipment that goes into the lakes. Um, so we, we really do try to uh, make sure what we're studying and what we're working with belongs there. <laughs> right. Exactly. It, yeah. it doesn't do you much good in an ecological study to bring the organisms yeah. there that you want to study. And it's even more of an issue in these subglacial lake systems where there's so much less biology. There, everything that goes into the hole goes through an ultraviolet collar that destroys DNA. Yeah. And all of the water is purified, ultraviolet uh, processed before it goes in as well. Yeah. So uh, depending on how biologically rich your setting is, you need to take different levels of precaution. If you need to destroy all DNA because right. you're looking for traces of DNA, or if you just need to make sure there aren't viable organisms going into that to lake. Into that lake. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. It's a great question, uh, very good one. And it's interesting because um, you know this whole issue of cross-contamination, which has its own problems, but also scientifically it means right. you know, you're not really looking at something right, right. <laughs> something native. Um, you know, there's debate raging now, uh, as you're probably well aware, you know, we, methane was supposedly found on Mars quite mm -hmm. some time ago. Mm -hmm. Now that's being raised into question by other scientists. I guess a European team has, has done some other um, analysis from, from, I believe, uh, orbiting platforms mm -hmm. where they're saying, we're not seeing any methane. So the question becomes, was the methane, you know, really like in the plastics or other materials oh. on, on the systems that detected it in the first place? So <laughs> yeah, there's a great, great issue of how important it, you know, things like cross-contamination are. Right. So what's in, in this picture? Um, ah, so it looks like you're making igloos. Yes. Well, so when you're doing field work in Antarctica, they want to make sure they're not going to send you out to a place where you are ill-prepared. Uh -huh, uh, so there's actually helpful. a snow school associated with the U.S. Antarctic program oh, that's great. where you go out and learn to set up all the tents, you build a snowball. It's a little bit less appropriate for the dry valleys where we don't have snow <laughs> uh, in terms of the training, right. but it is a really good familiarization with your cold weather gear, making sure that you're actually able to be in a safe space personally so you can do your science. Mm -hmm. It's a, there are a lot of confounding factors doing field work in an extreme place, sure. just like in space, yeah. where you can be very task loaded just in keeping yourself all right. Right. Um, well, you know, I'm, I'm as fascinated talking to Dale about yeah. the logistics yeah. and, you know, physical aspects of, of his field work in, in Lake Untersea as I am about, you know, the science that's being done. Right. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. And you really have to that gets built into uh, operations in Antarctica. These are called, uh, they're Scott tents, uh -huh. after Scott. Yeah. Um, it's uh, basically a modification of that design that they used to do their polar expeditions. Mm -hmm. And so they're really durable, have a lot of anchor points, they can survive very high winds. They're not light, yeah, um, it looks but like they're heavy these, canvas, these so big heavy too. canvas tents with uh, big strong poles that you can uh, very securely anchor. And in our uh, our camps now in the dry valleys, they're most often used as our toilet tents. Oh, interesting. So they're not quite the glamorous uh, a tent that they once were, but they're the, the workhorse that you really don't want to fly away. <laughs> exactly. All right. Any more uh, pictures that you wanted to share before we oh, sign off here? Well, uh, maybe I'll, I'll leave with uh, just a quick uh, image of diving in the lakes here, if I can navigate to that, um, just to show uh, what our main motivation is um, and what that work looks like. So here we go, let's pull this up. So this is sort of the end result of all of this work is getting us to the point that we can enter into these lakes 
and and do this science. So this, uh, this is what you've been waiting for, folks. So I know. Sorry, I'll leave to on. I'll leave keep on a high you note. <laughs> waiting so long, but this is this is what you wanted yeah. to see. So we've flown to Antarctica. We've gotten geared up in McMurdo. We've helicoptered to the dry valleys, and now we have made a hole that we can. Uh, enter into the lake and explore uh, this microbial landscape. Go ahead and I'll run that up, again. Uh, I'll pull up a continu continuation of that actually. Oh, okay, great. Where we can uh, show the, uh, well, okay. And Ian here has uh, just finished a dive, so that's probably the worst position that you can find yourself in. Because you're is wet, wet from a dive <laughs> yeah. and on the surface, yeah. tending someone else's line. Ooh. So that's that's the job you don't want. So, but you're down there alone, so you're not yes. buddy diving. Here. No, oh. it's a uh, it's actually safer to be diving solo uh -huh. because you don't have the risk of tangling up tethers, uh -huh. okay. and you have someone who can then come in, Ian suited up already, and he can put on another uh, kit to come down if there's any issue. I see. But since we have communication okay. lines, we That's don't the thing. Yeah, you're, you're in communication. Exactly. And, right, right. But you need special helmets that allow you to have yes. the communication, yes. the radio work, and uh, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Wow. Well, Tyler, thank you so much. Well, this thank is you very, very cool, literally and scientifically. <laughs> uh, and so I hope you, you all enjoyed that, and thank you for, for uh, joining us today. Uh, you know, again, this is a, a fascinating example of the breadth of research that is all part of this big uh, picture uh, of, you know, trying to understand life in the universe, trying to answer that question, are we alone? You know, it takes us to the bottom of the earth and the top of the earth and frozen lakes and points in between, and all of this, you know, helps us as we endeavor to understand and try to figure out how we find life elsewhere. And uh, so it's it's really terrific. and. Um, uh, something, however, that isn't cool is when we can't do science any longer. And right now, um, as you all know from the government shutdown, you know, there's no science at NASA going on right now. There's no science at NSF going on right now. Uh, we have uh, NASA and NSF funded programs on our, many of our NASA funded research programs were still able to do the work because the funding came in before the shutdown. When that funding dries up, the work stops. We've already lost some uh, researches to the shutdown. They've been furloughed because of the contracts they are part of. Uh, so this, this shutdown affects not only the direct employees of places like NASA, the National Science Foundation, the TSA, our Coast Guard, and others, but there's a, a, an additional community of over a one million individuals who are working at different organizations, research organizations, um, and, and companies and contractors who support uh, the work of these government uh, agencies that are also out of work now or being shut down. Uh, I think it's a disgrace that governmental politics and fights over budget um, can happen at the expense of ongoing work and research. We're, we're losing ground in science and exploration and discovery as we do nothing. And meanwhile, you know, our competitors in places like Russia and China and India continue unabated where science is generously supported. So if you're as outraged as I am and as we are at the SETI Institute um, about you know, how the government is using federal employees as political pawns in a, in a battle over budgets, um, you should let your, your senator and senators and, and congressmen or women know how you feel. Uh, to me, it's, it's not right. Uh, there should be other ways to fight these battles and we shouldn't be doing that at the expense of air traffic safety, uh, Coast Guard, uh, and coastal and marine safety, science and research and exploration. So uh, we do hope that this ends soon. Uh, it's already starting to take a toll here and it's economic toll and toll in other areas is being felt uh, increasingly every day. Hopefully our friends in Washington will find a way to, to, to get behind this problem and, and resolve it and get everybody back to work, back at doing science and the great things that uh, people like Tyler and our colleagues here at the Institute and NASA and elsewhere are doing. So uh, anyway, with that unhappy note to end on, we do look forward to seeing you next week. One way or another, we will be back here uh, with another Facebook Live edition. Uh, thanks for joining us today from all over our planet, and we'll see you again soon. And Tyler, thanks again. Thank that you very great. much. That was very cool. Take care, everybody.